Okay, well, this is a uh, back um, in the last person uh, to take the conference. Everyone's tired and waiting for the Uber or vote. Uh, and so rather than trying to dabble you with a bunch of results from a bunch of papers, uh, I thought I would kind of uh, do something very low ground. Uh, this will all be counting on my fingers. Uh, but try to delve into a particular set of ideas and techniques that we use through a bunch of, of, of papers, um, which I think are, are uh, will, uh, will be insightful and hopefully uh, uh, pleasing to everyone who's. Oh, yeah, no. What? Now it's good? Okay. Let's go back. Okay, so uh, first of all, this is based on uh, uh, a collaboration with uh, uh, my student Grant Elliott at UT and, and Monica and Craig, who are uh, here at this conference. And it has to do with exploring the, the zoo of 40N equals two quantum field theories or super conformal field theories, of which there are many, many constructions. There's Lagrangian field theories, there are theories of class S, there are T2 compactifications of 6010 theories. There are F theory constructions directly in four dimensions, blah, blah, blah. And there is a very elaborate structure of these theories, which we're trying to um, uh, 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 unravel. Uh, Monica talked about non trivial isomorphisms between theories constructed in, in different ways. Um, there are S dualities, which another class of isomorphisms, which I think are best understood from the point of view of class S, where the conformal manifold of these theories, roughly speaking, the moduli space of genus G uh, curves with, um, uh, uh, with N punctures, and each Hence decomposition of the curve. Um, so let's see, for genus zero, there are n minus one double factorial of those. Um, for each pants decomposition, you get a realization of the theory as some um, gauging with some uh, 3g minus three plus n simple factors in the gauge group of an isolated SCFT. And so there are lots of different realizations, all of which give you the same family of theories, but in non-trivially related ways. All of that is, is by way of preamble. What I want to talk about is the last bullet point on, on this slide, namely the renormalization group flows uh, between these theories. And in particular, uh, I want to talk about the Higgs branch uh, renormalization group flows, which are triggered by turning on a VEV uh, for some um, uh, uh, operator that, that parameterizes the Higgs branch of the theory and then flowing to the infrared. So why is this interesting? Well, one uh, a place where it proved useful, and you saw, maybe saw in Monica's talk, is to proving some of these non-trivial isomorphisms. So that is the following. Say you have two theories, T1 and T2, which you believe are isomorphic. Um, might happen that they both are related, uh, they both come from some parent theory in the ultraviolet via some Higgs branch RG flows. So you turn on a VEV for an operator O1 and I flow to theory T1, turn on a VEV for an operator O2 and I flow to theory T2. But it might turn out that that parent theory has a symmetry, an automorphism, uh, which exchanges the operators O1 and O2 and therefore explains why the two child theories, T1 and T2 are actually the same. They were, uh, uh, really, the operators were related in this trivial way, not maybe not trivial, this in some way in the ultraviolet, and uh, that then relates the RG flows that took you to these two seemingly different theories. Another application of these sort of things is to just is to computing properties of the infrared SCFT, which sometimes are easier to compute in the ultraviolet. Now. Maybe you're lucky and you can argue that they're renormalization group invariant. And therefore, if I can compute them in the UV, I know what they are in the infrared. 
Or maybe, it's slightly more non-trivial, they change under RG flow, but change in some way that's actually computable. And so again, if you can compute them in the ultraviolet, and if you can compute how they change, then you know what they are in the infrared theories. So how should we study these things? Um, one uh, very important tool is uh, uh, when these, uh, we have the 60 one zero realizations, uh, many of these RG flows, these Higgs branch RG flows are, are uh, realized as kind of geometric transitions of the, uh, 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 the uh, 60 curve con F theory curve configurations on the tensor branch. The point of view that I want to talk about today uh, is actually the through the directly in four dimensions, or maybe in two dimensions, the fact that every Chris Beam and his collaborators showed in a very beautiful series of papers that every 4D n equals 2 SCFT in a natural way produces for you a 2D VOA. Uh, and uh, this will be a, the, the, the tool we will use to study the RG flows, uh, the Higgs branch RG flows of these theories. And the claim I want to make is that the 2D VOA that you get changes in certain very well-defined waves under this RG flow. And that will be uh, where we win. So I have to give a very brief uh, review, which could be a whole talk in itself, but it will go by fast and hopefully painlessly of the construction of these VOAs. So first of all, um, there's a classification, the operators in a conformal field theory are organized into multiplets of the conformal, or in this case, super conformal invariants. Some of those are short multiplets. Those were classified by Dolan and Osborne, and I'll use Dolan and Osborne's inscrutable notation for denoting the various short multiplets. But among those, there are certain operators which are conformal primaries, but not necessarily super conformal primaries. Uh, with whose uh, uh, you know conformal weights and spins and R charges. So capital R is the SU2 R charge, the highest weight. Little r is the U1 R charge. J1 and J2 are the spins. Delta is the scaling dimension. And so we're looking for operators which satisfy that. They're conformal, but not necessarily super conformal primaries. And they occur in the following multiplets. Uh, they're the super conformal primary of the B hat sub R multiplet. The second superconformal descendant in the C hat multiplet, the first superconformal descendants in D and D bar. And there are a few special cases to, um, to uh, keep in mind. Uh, one special case, the B hat R guys are the coordinate ring of the Higgs branch. Those are the guys we're going to be turning on. Uh, so, and among those special cases, yet more special, if I have two. B hat one half operators, that's a free hypermultiplet. The simplest possible n equals two super conformal field theory, the free hypermultiplet. B hat one, which are either you know quadratic things in, in, in the free case or just things by themselves, are the moment maps for the hyperkähler isometries of the Higgs branch. That will be important. D000 plus D0, D bar is the free vector multiplet, the second simplest for the n equals two super conformal field theory, just the free uh, 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 abelian vector multiplet. And C hat zero, zero, zero is the stress tensor multiplet. It contains the stress tensor, the R currents of the n equals two theory and so on. Okay, so what do we do? How do you make a VOA out of this? Well, what you do is you start by confining yourself to the uh, x1 equals x2 equals zero plane, combine x3 and x4 into a complex coordinate, and then you find a particular linear combination of a supercharge and a superconformal charge, uh, 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 q, with the following properties. First of all, it squares to zero. Second of all, it commutes with every shore operator you would insert at the origin. Third, it also commutes with a set of generators of the super conformal of the conformal algebra, namely translations in my plane, a uh, holomorphic translations in my plane, would be more precise, some combination of a dilatation and a rotation in the plane, and this particular special conformal transformation. The corresponding Z bar guys are not Q in closed. They're not Q invariant. But 
something comes to save you, you can twist them by saying, uh, the um, SU2 R generators at lay basis. So you improve uh, the bar translation by adding a loading operator in SU2 R so on. And that forms a spin one DC system with C equals minus two. Um, the sure operator in the C hat multiplet, that's one, some component of the R symmetry current. Uh, and that becomes the 2D stress tensor. And the two point function of the R symmetry current is proportional to the C vial anomaly coefficient in four dimensions. The two point function of the 2D stress tensor is proportional to the Verisoro central charge, and they're related this way. Okay. Uh, B hat one, remember, those were the moment maps for the hypercalar isometries of the Higgs branch. Those become currents in the 2D vertex operator algebra. And the current algebra levels of the 4D current algebra and the 2D current algebra are related this way. Great, so now you can construct the vertex operator algebra for any Lagrangian field theory uh, you want. Uh, all you need to do is take free vectors in the Lie algebra of some compact Lie group, um, free hypers in some representation of that group. The free hypers, you can then you know, construct the quadratic expressions, which are the moment maps with the G action, right? And then you construct a BRST operator that looks like the usual thing you'd write down, and you say, well, is Q squared zero? That's a condition on the representation R, and it's precisely the condition that the beta function vanish. The beta function vanishes, Q squared equals zero, and the cohomology Q on this free vertex algebra is the vertex algebra interacting for the gauge theory. That was all about the introduction. This is the first slide of the actual talk. Okay. So we're going to play the infrared theory to the top.
doing that. Uh, the vial anomaly coefficients in the 4D theory, um, and the, I can relate. So there's one quantity that I happen to like, an effective number of, of vector multiplets in the 4D theory. And this was the to change in the dimension of the Higgs branch is related to the change in C and A by this. I'm not saying that the Higgs branch dimension is equal to that, but the change is, is equal to the change in those guys. And the upshot of all of this stuff here is I can write a formula that looks like this, relating the change in, in the effective value of N sub V, the change in the Higgs branch dimension, which I told you was given up here, to um, the, this thing, a multiple of the 4D current algebra level and the ghost central charge. So that's the formula. And now let's do a simple example, just to kind of you know see where we're going. Let's imagine I have some simple factor in the 4D flavor symmetry algebra at some level k. I choose alpha to be the, the highest root of f. Um, and now um, the highest root current becomes dimension zero by the formula I just gave you. There are, and this is some weird um, Lie algebra fact that I couldn't find anywhere, but it's true. Um, uh, there are two dual Coxeter number minus four guys, which become dimension a half. And I can split, why does it keep doing that? I can split them into two kind of Lagrangian subsets where within each subset, the OPEs are, are non-singular, but between them, they fuse into the highest root moment map. Okay, so, so beta i, the index runs from one to dual Cox root number minus two. And let me assume this isn't always gonna be true, but it's true in the, this defines what I mean by the vanilla case, that all other sure operators, their shifted dimensions are greater than or equal to one. So I don't need to do anything about them. I just need to deal with these guys with the highest root guy, which became dimension zero, and these guys, which became dimension a half. So I write down a BRST operator. I have the, the highest root guy. He got, became dimension zero, so I can fix him not necessarily to zero, but to any non-zero complex number, and that's kind of the generic thing to do. So I'll fix him to some non-zero complex number, and then fit, and here I'll introduce those for half of these guys, my Lagrangian subset, and this thing squares to zero very trivially, and um, uh, C ghost, what's C ghost? Well, I had one spin one ghost and uh, H check minus two spin one half ghosts. So this adds up to H check minus four. Uh, the total number of ghosts I added was H check minus one. And so delta N sub V is K minus one. That's the prediction that I get out of this. And indeed that works very beautifully. Let me do a more complicated example because you know that, that was really too easy. Um, let me do something from class S. So there's a particular nilpotent orbit in E7, which is labeled by Bela and Carter in this way. And it has a flavor symmetry SU2 at level 224, okay? So, oh, that should be an alpha. So let's choose alpha to be the positive root of the SU2 and let's deform in the way I just described. So the uh, positive root moment map becomes dimension zero, but there are a bunch of uh, other guys that also become dimension zero. As it turns out, there's a, a B hat two operator, which has a guy that becomes dimension zero. Then there's a B hat two operator. So this is the spin of the representation under this SU2 224. So this was the adjoint. Then there's a, a the, the spin two representation, which picks up a guy, there's a spin four representation where there's a guy that becomes dimension zero, but then some guy that becomes dimension minus one and minus two. And then over here, there's another guy that becomes uh, dimension zero. And so I need to add um, a, a, a bunch of spin one goes, one, two, three, four of them to get rid of these guys that became dimension zero. A spin two goes, to get rid of uh, uh, the guy that became dimension minus one. And now, the, 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 you know the central charge of that, I'm sure, but you may not remember the central charge of a spin three ghost, it's minus 74. And then I have to have one of those. And so the ghost contribution to the central charge is minus 108. 
Uh, I had to add in total six, four plus one plus one is six ghosts. So I, the pig's branch dimension goes down by six. Um, and generically, I had to turn on VEVs for all of the guys in red. So I had to turn on, fix those to you know four generic non-zero complex numbers. Um, I put all of this together. And what I find is that the effective value of N sub V changes by 186, which is to say this nilpotent orbit gets Higgs to that nilpotent orbit. Some totally non-obvious thing. Um, trust me, it's not obvious. Um, but okay, I, I mean, I, again, I apologize. Last talk of the conference, we're all tired. All I've done is literally counting on my fingers, right? I've shown you how the, the VOA predicts two numbers about the infrared theory, right? Effectively, really, I was really just telling you what A and C are for the infrared theory, given the data of the UV theory, okay? I wasn't telling you anything more than that. It might have seemed fancier at the time, but that's just because you're tired. It's really just, I'm telling you what A and C are for the infrared theory based on what the UV theory was. Um, but the VOA contains infinitely more information than that. And I have not exploited it here, but we can exploit it and, and we do exploit it and we get interesting results from the, the statement that the VOA of the infrared theory is this BRST cohomology of the improved VOA of the infrared theory. And there's a lot more that you can extract from that in principle. And when you put it together with information, say from the 60 curve configuration or whatever, you can really learn a lot. And so there's the, I'm very optimistic that there's a lot of stuff you can say about these Higgs branch RG flows between these, this zoo of 40n equals two theories and um, say something interesting. So uh, let me stop and thank the organizers for putting together an absolutely wonderful conference. And, and let's give Jonathan and Miriam and whoever else is here a, a big round of applause because they've done a fantastic job. Uh, chapter and the next one. Questions? Do you understand how all these in the video ways help come up with a measurement? Well, I mean, you're asking, so the, the, the VOA, as I said, is constructed out of the sure operators of the theory. So some things are easy to understand from 60. I mean, in principle, everything should be understood, but some things are easy to understand. So for instance, if you want to know what the global symmetries are, are, in other words, the B hat one operators, that's actually read off very directly from, from 60 because you can really read off the flavor symmetries from there. There are other things that are less easy to understand. And, and uh, it, to be honest, there are many things that, well, there's an infinite number of things that I don't understand. You didn't actually talk about the city of you Oh, oh, uh, the, the, you're saying in, 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 in class S, let's say. I mean, you could look at the class S, but you were supposed to think of, is there anything more than animals to choose you? realize that you realize that you can be on a place where there's similarity. Right. You don't understand how to track the way and track those. Only via one of these two approaches. I don't really understand how to do it directly from the type to be on a you know singular Calabio uh, uh, perspective, but if 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 I can extract from that some information about the VOA, I'm good. If I can extract from that you know a 6D curve configuration, I'm also good, but good in slightly different ways. Um, but directly from type to be, I, I, I honestly, I, I, there's very little. I, I mean, I like that perspective, but there's very little concretely that I know how to say without more work. And the more work ends up really amounting to translating it into one of these other 
pictures of, of, of the spirit. Any more questions? Thank you for the reference. I'm sorry for the system of past series. When you do this, it's not about the book. Is it a unique dependency of the figures of the author of the books? So, yeah, I didn't emphasize that, but the the, the whole spectrum of sure operators transforms in a very well-defined way under the operations that I just gave you. So if you want to read off what the b-hat one operators are of the infrared theory, you totally can do that. Moreover, you can read off the levels of the infrared current algebra. I didn't, the, the, the two examples I gave you didn't illustrate this, but the levels of the infrared current algebra, even if the currents are preserved, the levels can change because you may need to modify the currents to get something that commutes with the BRST operator that I defined. So you may have to add some ghost contributions to get something that commutes with the BRST operator. When you do that, that'll change the level, but in a well-defined way. So, I, so yes, so you can track through the VOA, you can track what the symmetries do, you can track what the levels do. And that was actually one of the applications that I sort of cryptically alluded to in, in, in my introduction. I said, one of the things you can track is what the, what the flavor symmetries are and what the, what the current algebra levels of the flavor symmetries are through these RG flows. So, yes. Okay, uh, in that case, I think we should play Jack again.